Today's episode of Running It Back is brought to you by Dr. Scholl's Inserts. Not a sponsor. I just got high arches. I need an insole. Always have. Hey, thanks for listening to Running It Back. Today on the show, Omar Carmona joins me, my longtime friend. You might know him from my other show on the channel, The Sunday Night Talk, where we talk NFL and beyond Sunday nights. But he is on Running It Back this time. I've been wanting to do one with him for a while. I have known Omar for a long time. And we wanted to pick a topic to talk about that is poignant to sports, the times that we are in now, and break it down. That's what we did for this running it back uh, on this episode. We ran it back to 2001. This is post 9-11 by a month and a half. World Series, the first pitch thrown out by then President George W. Bush. It was a moment in the country where things were at a bit of an unease like it is now. The country was figuring out who was going to take the leadership role. What was that going to look like for the foreseeable future? I thought that was an interesting time in the country related to sports. It's a time I experienced as a young person. Omar did. We were in different parts of the country as well. So we sort of dove into our reactions of it, where we were in life, and then also where we were in 2001 before that, leading up to it and after it as well. We do a bit of an interview with Omar as well, which was really good to dive into Omar's career path. Really fun stuff. Hey, everyone. Don't forget me performing stand-up comedy soon. As you listen to this, I'll be performing Saturday, November 28th on the Flappers Comedy Club Zoom show. Yeah, everything's on Zoom these days. This is the way it's going to be for a while, so it's still pretty fun. Coolest thing about it is anybody in any town can watch it. So you can see me do comedy on the 28th. I think that's a Saturday. Hey, that's a Saturday after Thanksgiving. There's going to be a lot of things to talk about. So, so running it back this episode with me and Omar Carmona, man, did we dive into 2001 and beyond the first pitch from the world series game three Yankees versus the Arizona Diamondbacks a moment in time. Me and Omar, here we go. All right, we're back. Joining me on another episode of Running It Back with me today, Omar Carmona. How are you, buddy? Doing great, bud. How are you? Good. Hey, uh, you're usually on the Sunday Night Talk show with me that we do where we summarize, we recap, chat a bit about the all the day's happenings in NFL, but <clears throat> special one today. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, I've been circling this topic for a while, trying to figure out an angle of how to broach this. Cause you know, we all, we talk sports, but we try and dive a little deeper into it. Kind of like we do on the Sunday night, but I was trying to think of a, we just got through November. We got through election time, but we got sports going on with election stuff. Right. And I wanted to think of another time that sports played a big role in an American time. That was, I guess you would say a little bit fragile at the time. I, That's what I think, I think very fragile. Yeah. We're in a fragile time right now. And it's sort of interesting how we're balancing sports with it, how the players are, how viewers are. And I was thinking of another time that we were close to this or similar to it. And for this one, you know, I thought of um, the George W. Bush first pitch in the world series. This was after nine 11, 2001. Game and three. just sort of what that meant. It, it, it was the first game in New York. Cause remember that year, the diamondbacks had a better, I guess they had a better record. So they had home field advantage. I guess you want to say, so game three was the first, uh, I mean, 
I know there were some games after September 11, but that was the first real New York is alive after 9-11. Right. That, 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 was the, that was the biggest sports moment that New York had right after the tragedy. It was so it was so big for many, many reasons. I was trying to think of my thoughts around that game at the time. This is 2001. So 2001, I'm 21 years old. I'm in college. I went to college in New Mexico. And not being a huge baseball fan, I really just pay attention to playoffs and World Series. Right. So that's about my sports interest. However, the year being what it was after 9-11 being so fresh, I was kind of riveted to the game just for the spectacle of it. We had New York, and then the president of the United States is going to throw the first pitch. And I remember watching it and just sort of being like in awe of the moment, I guess. Like, wow, look at this. You feel the crowd. He throws a great first pitch, and he walks off the field. Right. It was a pretty, yeah, it was a pretty touching moment, no matter sports fan, political side. It was a moment that I think everybody sort of recognized. So 2001, I, I think I'm a junior in college. I have my, I have my, I'm going to college. I have my part-time job at a bicycle store. I was thinking about it. I was also an assistant RA at the time. I remember that. I forgot about that. I was an assistant. So I had my, I had a sweet dorm room all to myself. And I think I just sort of watched it by myself in passing to uh, just the game, having it on. And I think it made the world series a lot more important, even if I wasn't really a big baseball fan. Well, you know what? I don't think a baseball fan. I think you were just going for the Yankees. You know, it, it just felt, it just felt like because of what we had just been through, you had to root for the New York Yankees. Not because you like the Yankees, not because you are a Red Sox fan, not because you like football more than baseball or basketball, whatever. It just felt that year that now is the time to get behind. You You may have hated them for the longest time, but now is the time to get behind the Yankees. So you you sort of felt an affiliation to one of the teams? Because I never did. I, I just, oh, I, I wanted it all to be, all to be covered. I didn't have an affiliation. I felt so much nostalgia. I remember for the Yankees that I'm a, I am a lifelong Red Sox fan. And that was the one year and the only year because when first pitch 2002 was, you know, thrown out, uh, you know, screw the Yankees. I can't stand them. I can't stand Steinbrenner. Uh, I hate Steinbrenner. I hate Jeter. I hate uh, Andy Pettit. I hate Mariano Rivera. All the <laughs> are so good. But the bottom line is, that was the one year when it was okay to say I'm a Yankees fan. And because we were all rooting for the Yankees. I, yeah, I, I do remember a lot of New York sediment at the time and, and because mind, we were just so, so stammered they from were, earlier that month. They were, they, they had, they, they, I mean, they're the three time world champions. They won 98, 99 and 2000. Okay, I mean, so and then uh, 97, they did not win 96. They did win. So we're talking they've won four of the last five years going into this, you know, into this series. And, and so it just seemed like, okay, you know, they're the they're the they're the three. They're the recent four time champions. They're um, they're they're, they're going to roll through this uh, expansion team, Arizona Diamondbacks. And right, Arizona was very new. It was their fourth year in the league. Yeah, they, they they're very new. They had a, a team really of you know obviously they were riding the whole um, uh, Kurt Schilling, uh, Randy Johnson. Obviously, their owners really put in, pumped in a lot of money uh, to get those two aces, and they were worth every penny um, at that point. But I mean, they had Luis Gonzalez, you know, and he was their their number one hitter. I remember Tony Womack. I mean, they, I mean, they had some they had some decent players not to knock them, but it definitely wasn't the star power that the Yankees had. You know? Yeah. And, and that was always a good storyline is David versus Goliath Yankees right. versus blank. And, and you just had this feeling that is, and I, I was, a, I was a, you know, I think a sophomore or a sophomore, maybe a junior, yeah, a sophomore at St. Mary's university in San Antonio. 
and it, it, it just seemed that this, you know, it just seemed like a foregone conclusion. The New York Yankees were just going to roll through the Diamondbacks and, and, and these scrappy Diamondbacks put up a fight. And um, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say scrappy because like I said, you know, when you have Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling, your, 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 your one and two games are basically done. Um, but it just seemed like it was New York's title to win. Um, and, and obviously it didn't turn out that way, but I was a, I, I had an apartment. I had two roommates. I was working at the president's office at St. Mary's university, Dr. Cottrell. And, uh, I remember where I was at nine 11, obviously. And, uh, I, I remember that, you know, up until these last couple of weeks of obviously what's going on here in our country right now, um, I hadn't seen the news, uh, you know, before these last couple of weeks with the whole election thing, I hadn't seen the news this much since those few weeks right after 9-11. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you definitely remember where you were and how you were feeling at the time. Yeah, I remember my living in New Mexico. I was... It's a pretty, li- I went to a liberal arts school, so a very liberal state, a very left state. And that was essentially the sentiment. I remember I was going through my, my voting history too. I was trying to remember who I voted for every time. And this is how much of a bubble you can get into. I remember when it was Gore versus Bush and the, the thinking was in, in New Mexico, you know, Gore all the way, but hey, this Green Party candidate Ralph Nader, uh, this is who we really like. And I remember so much Ralph Nader talk. And I remember all the students saying, you know, if Ralph Nader gets, I think it was 3% of the popular vote, the Green Party would get like equal funding or something like that. So everybody, everybody was like, Ralph Nader all the way. And I was like, I can get down with that. I was all the way. And then a month later, I was like, 3%, screw that. He's going to win. Cause that's all I would hear was Ralph Nader. And then, you know, the, the results come back and like, he's, it gets nowhere near the percentage. So that's the bubble that I was in. And of course, Al Gore loses, George Bush wins, Ralph Nader's nowhere. It's like, but that's the bubble you're in. You think, oh, this is the way the whole country's thinking, but it's really just your, your small right. corner of the country. How was it for you? You're in Texas, you're in the heart of Texas. What was the feeling Texas, at yes, the time? A very Republican state, but you know, in San Antonio, very liberal. Um, and then in my, in you know, I, in my, in the office I was working at at the time at St. Mary's, it was a more liberal campus. But you know what? I mean, I, I think that was the one time that you know I, I can't think of another time in my lifetime that we've all put politics aside and said, you know what? Now we have a common goal. We have a common enemy. I mean, I think, I mean, as, as hateful as that sounds. So uh, definitely sports was on the back burner for a few days, but then it became apparent that sports had to come back on for us, yes. you know, and, and, you know, the NFL season had to get back on the college football season. I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe you looked into, you know, you, we were talking before the show. Can you remember who was, you know, who was number one, who was this, who's, I, you know, I mean, I want to say back in those days, I think Nebraska, I think they had Eric Crouch was a good quarterback out of Nebraska. Uh, I think they made a run. And I I was a huge Eric Crouch fan, number seven for Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the baseball teams, we obviously know what was going on in 2001. Obviously, the Lakers were were a big deal back then when they had Shaq and Kobe. Uh, You know, NFL 2001, didn't the Patriots kick off? You know, isn't that the the year Bledsoe got hurt and yeah, uh, that's and, true. And, that was the start of the, the Patriots. That was, dynasty I remember run. how big that was in that Super Bowl against the, was it the St. Louis Rams in time? Right. The Rams were looking to win another, their, their second Super Bowl. Um, not in a row. Cause I think the Ravens won. I think what they, they won. In You're right. Yeah. Rams won. Then Ravens, then Rams went again. And, and it was Rams, a foregone conclusion that they were going to win the Super Bowl against the Patriots. And of right. course, it was, it, was still, it was still the greatest show on earth. And, and, and I remember watching that Super Bowl when uh, the, the Patriots came out as a team. They were not introduced by offense, defense. Belichick says, we're coming out as a team because as a team, we got here. 
and it just seemed like that 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 set the tone for for that Super Bowl. Yeah, um, and which can just, I say with the coming out as a team? What what a what a dick move though. If you're the Rams, like at least tell me, Patriots, if you're gonna come out as a team, because yeah, then yeah. we look like the jerks. Yeah, we look like <laughs> jerks that we're all about. Me, 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 me. We inter- yeah. That, you know it's what? a great a, it's a great power move if you think about it you're like guys we're going up a, second that's a belichick move yeah it's like if we're going to be introduced second we got to go out as a team because we can only win if they go out as a team we go out as a team we match them but if they don't we look like the team and they look like the jerks and that's a, i do jerks. remember that everybody's like oh they're a team look at the rams they're individuals great great power move by Belichick scheming from the very beginning of the game. Scheming. I do remember as far as sports goes, I remember at the time George Bush was a bit of a punchline. He oh, was yeah. kind of made fun of on late night TV. He was kind of bumbling, but I do remember after nine 11 and then the, the weeks following, I do remember a sense of like, all right, let's, let, let's, let's, let's try. Let's, let's get behind this guy. He's our leader. Let's kind of put it all aside and let's try. It's a feeling that I don't think we have currently now. I don't right. think we have, we can put that aside now because we're so, so much, uh, so much divided. We've dug our heels in with whatever side we're on. But I do remember right. at the time, I'm like, all right, I can get behind. I didn't vote for George Bush, but I was like, I can get behind this guy. He's being a leader in a good sense. So I do remember a tiny bit of optimism at the time. It was like, all right, let's all, let's all pull in the same direction here. Right. There was the, there was the ground zero speech. And then there was the first pitch that I think was, if you had to pick a moment, the best moment of his presidency, it has to be one of those two. Yeah, I would, sure. I would guess the, the bullhorn speech or the first, first pitch um speech or first pitch at the at the yankees game for tonight's ceremonial first pitch and please welcome the president of the united states it's uh president presidential security wanted him to throw out the first pitch at either games one or two in Phoenix for security, President Bush insisted that he throw it out in New York. Uh, he wore a bulletproof vest underneath an FDNY jacket for right. the first pitch. Um, and then when you're rewatching it, you really don't notice it. It's not very noticeable uh, that he has something on underneath that. Uh, Todd Green, the, the Yankees backup catcher, caught the pitch. And then this is my favorite kind of fun one. Derek Jeter advised him before the game. Apparently he's throwing practice pitches uh, in a batting cage before the game. Advised him to do it from the mound. George Bush was going to do it from the base of the mound. He said, do it from the mound and don't bounce it. Saying, if you bounce it, they'll boo you. And then lastly, one of the umpires was uh, uh, for the first pitch was actually a secret service agent in disguise for extra yeah. sort yeah. of security. Yeah, yeah, really great. Yeah, really great detail. Just to what, what went on for this pitch to happen, it takes you back well, how on edge we were about crowds, about go, gatherings you like this. You go through a lot of planning, and the thing is, they, they didn't hide the fact that he was going to be there either. So it wasn't like he was the surprise, you know, uh, honorary first pitch you know hurler so yeah you had to you that that was some serious serious planning but there are a few things i want to i want to dissect in this pitch if, if you okay would, if i you got would. two last notes and then we'll dive into okay. our dissection uh upon the rewatch i was a little surprised how quickly it all happens too and then the shaking of the manager's hands and then the crowd erupts into the usa usa chant is I, an awesome moment. I, I, I think you put, a, you put aside your political leanings for at least 25 seconds for that awesome moment. Agreed. 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 No matter all. So, if you hate Bush or not. Yeah. It, yeah. That was a great moment. It's captured really well by the broadcast as well. The, the PA announcer for the Yankees introduces George Bush. He throws the pitch. He thanks him. 
And then the crowd goes, USA, USA. A tremendous moment in sports. And I really haven't heard it talked about too, too much, which, which I was really interested to dive into it. Uh, what surprised you on the rewatch of it okay. all? So I want to I want to take it back and remember you, we don't have a lot of camera time uh, to really dissect this because it, it like it was pretty quick I think you'd agree it was very quick but I want if, if you look at Fox's broadcast of it it was on right. Fox right it was on Fox yeah it was Tim McIver and uh, Joe Buck are the call okay. I, wa- I ended up watching the whole game I found a, a recording of the whole game and I watched it all just to just to get a feel for it. But yeah, on Fox with Joe Buck and McIver. So, so here's my, here's my initial, initial take. And this is what I appreciate about our president, George W. Bush, is how serious he took this. And I want to point out to, at one point in time before he's called out, he's sitting in the dugout. By the way, he was in the Yankees bullpen. I mean, in the Yankees dugout. Not, mm-hmm. the, not, not the D-backs. And I'm not, you know, I'm just... I'm just thinking maybe he was also into the the Yankees love affair. I'm going to throw that out there that he was into the Yankees and you know get his right hand and the way he's grabbing the baseball. He already has like a split finger type. So, you know he's taking this seriously. Like he's not just out here to toss a ball. You know he really wants to do a great job in front of the American people, which I appreciate. So I want you to look if if you go through the if you go through the rewind is look at his hand, look at his fingers and he's already got that ball grasp uh in a way that he's going to he really wants to throw a good pitch, okay? That's that's my first takeaway. There's people targeting him. I mean, maniacs, you know, mm-hmm. there's terrorists out there. I, you know, we don't know what what's going on right now. I mean, this is so close uh from 9/11. We don't know what's happening. But he does look a little uneasy, and and I appreciate that he's so went out there. Okay, I really mm. do appreciate. Uh, I don't think our current leader would do that, but that's another another show for another day. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, we need a Donald Trump tie-in with sports somehow. <laughs> that's going to take well, years in the making. I, I think I think we got to do that maybe sometime in January when the, <laughs> the transfer of power is finally <laughs> finally done. But but he does look a little uneasy. He 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 doesn't look. Um, he doesn't look extremely comfortable and you could even tell by his facial expressions, but I will say this, but he's comfortable enough to go to the pitcher's mound, which in my, if it were me, I would do a few practice throws and, uh, you know, while the stadium was empty. And I'd probably realize that from the pitcher's mound to the, to the home plate, I'm probably not going to make it only because, you know, I'm not a real man. So, <laughs> you know, I, I I respect the fact that he's out there wearing an FDNY, you know, windbreaker. He's out there and he goes straight for the pitcher's mound. That guy throws one pitch and it's so quick. You know, it's like he really had time to dissect it and, and, you know, to, to really feel the wind or the air around him or, you know, get comfortable with the sound, the noise, because it was loud. He just goes out there, gets to the pitcher's mound and just hurls a strike. So, take over from there but i i thought he was nervous until the point that he threw the ball when he was he had an extreme amount of poise yeah it's interesting you said you you saw a little nervousness in him because i was going to say the exact opposite it's like he goes out there he's standing tall and then i think about it how quickly he goes into his wind up uh, the, he beats the camera the camera is, has a tight shot on his face and then he goes into the windup and the camera has to switch real quick. And that makes sense. Like he's nervous. He's speeding this up. What, what, what's he throws, crazy. He, he throws a looking, perfect strike. He's looking around. He looks at the crowd. He waves. And then it's wind up and he throws. Right into it. Yeah. I mean, that's insane. I mean, I, I mean, that's a great pitch. Yeah. I, I didn't see the nervousness until you brought that up. Uh, when I was like, oh, yeah, he was moving fast. I thought it was like, yeah, there would so, be some nerves in there. Pay attention to the nerves from the dugout to the walk to the mound. Then it seems like he gathered himself for a split for a split second. Mm-hmm. But but again, if you look and then if you look afterwards, he meets up with the managers up. Was it Bob Brenly and Joe Torre? And, and and didn't it seem to you like he was 
he was a little more. He was a, he was leaning a little more towards uh, Joe Torre. It, that, that, that's what it seemed to me. It, it didn't. Yeah, seem like- the Arizona guy gets him first. He shakes his hands first, and it took a few feeds of, of me searching in YouTube to hear what the manager says. And the Arizona manager says he says good stuff, Mister President. Good stuff. Like he's pumped. And then Joe Torre. I, there's no audio on Joe Torre or anything. And then when they pose for the picture, the crowd starts the USA chant. So that was the moment for me. If you were to just take a snapshot of it, I want the managers with George Bush uh, picture. If I'm grabbing a, a screen grab of the event, that's the part I like the most. Just from a, just like you're saying, the nervous part from a baseball superstition spot too. He steps on the foul line. You know, I think most players superstitiously don't step on the foul line when they enter the diamond. You know, he steps on the foul line. So he's not looking down straight to on top of the mound, throws it. And then I was thinking, if you're the guy catching the first pitch from the president, you got to be nervous out of your mind too. You got to think like, all right, first pitches are always a little wild. Who knows what's going to happen? What if he hurls one in there? The catcher, the backup catcher who caught his pitch, underrated, underrated position catching that pitch. Kind of, kind of interesting to it all. Yeah, and then uh, the uh, PA announcer gives them the thank you, the mi- thank you, Mr. President, um, right. and uh, the famous New York Yankees PA announcer. Thank you, Mr. President. And kudos to Buck and McIver for just letting the moment simmer. They right. don't chime in. They don't speak till well after. And, and uh, they they could have let it even go longer too. You know, one thing about one thing about both those guys, uh, McCarver and Buck, is, is, is I think they've always been uh, respectful and appreciative of the moment that they're in. Uh, and I will say that about th- especially those two guys. Yeah, I think Joe Buck has mentioned in interviews before that he modeled a lot of his a lot of his announcing after uh, Pat Summerall, who would let the moment. Sith. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He, there was, uh, so uh, you watch old Pat Summerall, old, John Madden games. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of silence. Oh, when the crowd's going, Pat Summerall lets the crowd, he lets, he lets the audio pick up the crowd for a long time before he finally says something. Yeah. It's a, it's a counterintuitive thought with announcing is I got to fill something with words, information, but yeah, Summerall. And then Buck has mentioned that he's taken from that script is let the moment sit and really let it come through the screen. So kudos to him and McIver for not talking over uh, a great, great moment. Un- yeah. Like an un, no way of knowing this. How fast do you think that pitch came in to the catcher? 70. 70. <laughs> uh, I'm asking the question. I'm thinking like, I can't even make an estimation. I know what a fast pitch goes for oh. but i don't know what an amateur pitch would go for <laughs> i'd say maybe just a little less than 70 you know what is really tricky about say someone told you or me you're gonna throw the first pitch at a baseball game you and me would probably say like all right well i'm gonna prepare in the backyard i'm gonna warm up i'm gonna get a you know i'm gonna get get a sweat going i'm gonna get my pitch going right. but when you actually throw the first pitch you go out cold. It's not like you throw a few practice ones. Like go out there, you got one pitch. Uh, that's really hard to do. And then secondly, you don't have a glove on the other hand. You're throwing it two bare hands. I think that's a little unnatural to people too. If you're throwing a baseball, as you expect a glove on the other hand, but not for a first pitch. They typically don't go out with a glove. Right. Yeah, it's a great tradition that first pitch. I guess the coin toss, the celebrity coin toss for like an NFL game is the equivalent, but nothing beats that first pitch because you have to physically do something and there's an end result. Did you do it well or did you do it poorly? Exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to think of other moments in crucial American time that kind of revolved around sports. I don't think there's too many of them out there. It takes some deep research to really find something. I'm thinking right off the bat, the, um, the game after the earthquake game, uh, with, uh, Oakland A's and San Francisco giants, 
Although I can't remember a moment, but I do remember getting back to baseball. That was big. Um, the New Orleans Saints back oh, from uh, the uh, Katrina, Katrina Monday night game would be would be another one. But it's it's really hard to time these things up with some sort of national tragedy that really turns a corner with a sporting event. So that yeah, that's a moment everybody should go back and rewatch that on on YouTube. There isn't too much kind of oral history on it or documentaries on it, which I was surprised. I found one little snippet of it where players are, are talking about their reactions to it, but there's not too much about it. It's a great moment. Right. It was a great moment. Absolutely. I got a few um, sports happenings from that 2000, that 2001 era. So the Arizona Diamondbacks go on to win that series. They win the World Series over the Yankees that year. Uh, Super Bowl, we mentioned it. The New England Patriots win the Super Bowl that year, kicking off the dynasty. Yep. Uh, not to mention same same year as the infamous Tuck Rule. Yep. That's was that pl- was that playoff run? You know what? I always forget about that playoff run with the Patriots is that conference championship game they play against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Tom Brady gets injured and Drew Bledsoe has to finish off that game. And, and there was question whether or there not was Tom a little Brady, Bledsoe talk. There was, there was question whether or not Brady would be ready for that Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was an interesting tidbit. I forgot about that. I rewatched that game a couple of years ago. I was like, I forgot Bledsoe has to come in in relief for Brady. And he actually plays, plays pretty good. Uh, NBA, the Lakers win the championship. They sweep the nets. Dynasty here, the dynasty full, full, full swing LA Laker dynasty. Uh, Tiger Woods wins the masters that year. Uh, big, um, surprise, big surprise there. This is, yeah, this is another Tiger Woods dynasty time. Um, okay. Best picture. Who do you think won best picture? 2001. This is, um, 2001 yeah so the oscars happened i had to look it up this ha- the oscars happened in 2002 but this is right. four movies of 2001 okay bear with me here i want to say that in 2000 it was the gladiator now maybe you have the list there i don't know i have it yeah yeah i have the the answers okay, so, okay. i don't I- think gladiator was 2000 wasn't gladiator gladiator earlier was it 99? I, I think Gladiator was 99. Okay. I, I, I'm going to say the 2001 Best Picture, A Beautiful Mind. Was I, am I off? You got it. A beautiful, it was mind. a beautiful Mind. You got it. Sweet. No, no research, folks. No research here. I don't know how you pulled that. I was looking them up, and I was like, I don't even remember. I couldn't have guessed this one. Uh, best Actor. Who do you think got Best Actor? 2001 shit uh, I, I don't think it was russell crowe although I, he, he was great but I, I don't think he won it the same year um all right give it to me denzel washington training day ah great movie yes yep yep you want to take a guess at best uh, actress i'm gonna guess again um Was it Halle Berry or Renee Zellweger for something? You got the Halle Berry part, right? Halle Berry. Okay. Yeah. Monsters bar. Yeah, ball. Monsters ball. That's what, yeah. Yep. Yep. She took best actress for the 2000, 2001 Oscars. I just, um, because I remember sometime in my early college years, I remember a beautiful dress she was wearing and it, you know, a lot of, lot Oh of, yeah. Of, yeah. A lot of good cleavage. Definitely. Definitely peak peak cleavage, peak uh, Entertainment Tonight television coverage. For sure. Of the Oscars. I remember, I remember peak, Halle uh, was somewhere there. Peak uh, E! Entertainment red carpet coverage too, I might, I might add. That was a heyday of E! Entertainment channel. It's so, it's so weird. You think about it. Um, we have lived through a whole genesis of a TV channel. Do you remember when the E! Channel first came out? Oh yeah. Remember uh, the was, E channel was, came out and it was, it was just nothing, movie previews? It was nothing, it was nothing but movie previews, 
Um, it, it would be like three weeks before of the release. It would be like inside Lethal Weapon Three. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like you know, it was we're just the, pulling, pulling we're for on ideas. The set with, we're on the set with Danny Glover and Mel Gibson. You know, for Lethal Weapon Three, and and oh yeah, I remember it was it was so great. Uh, Joan Rivers talking about all the the dresses and the fashion police. Um, and then of course she brought in Melissa Rivers and Howard Stern on the, yeah, which was had, a huge turning point for me because that's how I sort of got reacquainted with the Howard Stern show because they didn't carry the Howard Stern radio show in our hometown where we lived. Well, they, they, well, they did for a while. They did. And then they cut it they, multiple times. A, yeah. Problem because of uh, Selena and all that Yeah. Stuff. People should know our hometown of El Paso, Texas Selena, the Selena tragedy happens. Howard Stern makes fun of it. The next day, Howard Stern is cut from El Paso, Texas. <laughs> they did not after, take that night, take that well. But after they they aired and aired and re-aired and re-aired his apology, because he did apologize for it. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, he did. You'll probably you could probably find some video of it. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. So then E the E channel starts carrying Howard Stern, which was just was just um video of him doing his radio show yep. and that's how you got your Howard Stern fix in. That's how you kept up, which was really crazy because it's a radio station and you're watching it and you can finally get to see what these people look like. Yeah. Like, Oh, Howard looks like that. Robin looks like that. Fred, this guy, it was pretty revolutionary, which it kind of makes you wonder what happens to E if they don't have Stern, uh, I, you know, in those early years. What, yeah, was that, what was the Baywatch like kind of like spoof that they did? Oh, Son of the Beach. So, and, and, he was, and he was one of the creators or the I producers. I think he was. He? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mid 90s, late 90s TV was pretty big. Pretty big. I have, uh, oh, I got biggest grossing movie of 2001. What do you think it is? This is an uh, easy one when I tell you. Okay. Hold on. Let me, let me. Biggest grossing movie. This is the biggest grossing movie of 2001. Okay. It, it for sure, Armageddon, I want to say, was 98. I'm trying to work myself. Uh, take yourself back. Yeah. Duh. Tell, yeah. Up. Take me through your thinking process. Okay. So I, I know that we have Independence Day, Armageddon. Oh, I want to say, I'm probably wrong. I think I missed it by a year. Star Wars. Um, one of the Star Wars, was it the third one, the first one? No, uh, no second, you're wrong. Second one, second one. Second one. <laughs> no, you're, you're so wrong. It's Harry Potter. Oh, the first Harry Potter. It Harry has to be the first one, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't know it my has, Harry Potter been, canon. It had to have been Sorcerer's Stone. 2001? It, it had to have been. That was the biggest grossing film. Uh, what else do I have? A oh, top TV show. What do you think the top TV show? I found a few candidates for this, but this one seems to be the consensus top TV show. Top TV show. I mean, are we talking primetime show? Um, let me see. Let me look at this title. This would have been this would have been primetime, yeah. I don't think it's a, a not American Idol because that thing came out I think in 2002. Hmm. Top TV show, West Wing. Um, you're close, sort of in the genre. Twenty four. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Twenty four. Twenty four was a phenomenon that really like passed me by. I never watched Twenty Four. You know what? Neither did I. I do know. I do know that a lot of people liked it. Um, you know, think about you know. I I will say this: people don't realize because I think right now we are still in the golden age of television. Because when you think about it. I'd much rather watch a good series than I would a, um, a you know, a, a movie, uh, you know? Um, yeah, TV, entertainment, the way we consume it is but, really different. It's it's totally saturated now. It's it's almost much easier to miss, miss things now but, because we have a wealth of options. But let's talk about those days, okay? You know, you had 24. I talked about West Wing. Um, you know, the Sopranos, and we can even go pre-Sopranos, 
I mean, The Wire on HBO. I mean, we're talking about real series that were going to be developed over the course of a few seasons with characters and these whole arcs and whatnot. Um, that really was the beginning. That really kicked off like, hey, TV's back. You know, yeah, I mean, that was a version of TV. You're right. And think about that. We're, we're, we're moving on from Seinfeld. We're moving on from Friends. Um, we're moving on from a lot of these shows. We're going to do real dramatic TV and not soap opera stuff. You know, we're going to do what, what we, we want you to feel that same excitement in the movie theater, at, you know, we at home that you would in the movie theater. And, and so I think a lot of those shows, and I got to give HBO a ton of credit because it was Sopranos, Sex in the City, The Wire, Oz, and, 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 and you know, then eventually as, as years go on, Entourage. I mean, I mean, it had a whole range of comedy, drama, you know, a, a lot of stuff, dark comedy, um, you know, these, and then 24 on Fox. And mm -hmm. um, I, I never got into like those, you know, and, you know, NCIS and, and, and crap like that, but I shouldn't say that, but you know what I mean? I, I never got into it. Uh, but that, that to me was the kickoff of uh, TV's golden age. Were you, were you an HBO house? Did you have HBO? We did it in college. We had HBO. What about growing up? Cause I, I never grew up with HBO. Okay. I so would watch I, it at a friend's house and that was a huge treat if they well, had HBO or do you remember the HBO free month? Well, I, yeah, I remember that, but I remember I think you were watching some HBO in my house because you remember probably in the old in the old cable days, the cable company if you got HBO they'd come and they would drop off something that you'd have to screw into the back of your uh, right. That's right into your coaxial. It looked like a little like yeah. a little tube and you it was a, it. for like kids today. It looked like a little vape pen, it, and yeah. you screwed two yeah. ends into it and then one into yeah. your TV. Yeah, and that was and, your. How the, how the hell did that give you HBO? That makes no I, I, sense. I, I never understood that. Never understood. Well, never know. Yeah, but that, that's how you got HBO. But I was an HBO guy. I loved HBO. Yeah, HBO was was a treat. We never had it at my house unless it was a free month, and then you would watch it religiously, no matter what what movie was playing. You watched it, and then you'd set your VCR, and if something came on you liked, you would record it. So you could rewatch it over and over. So you would watch the movies and then HBO would enlighten you to their original programming. And you'd be like, what the hell is dream on? Well, let's see what this thing is. And you'd be like, that's a weird, kind of a weird. All right. Hey, what's Dennis Miller live? Oh, all right. Yeah, we'll check it. He's like, what is this world? And then, and then it'd be gone after a month. So I had to watch it at friend's house. So if I'd go over to your house as a kid, you had it. And then if you were up late at night, you know, that, that far into the night, then it'd be like, What's Beverly Hills Bordello? <laughs> What's Poison Ivy 3? <laughs> Who is Shannon Tweed? <laughs> there, was, there was great, great potential for skin late at night on HBO. And then if you dive deeper, the hierarchy went HBO, kind of classy skin. You were going to see some frontal. Below that was Showtime. You're going to see a little more skin, maybe some butts, maybe some frontal. And then below that was Cinemax. And that was also called Skinemax. Right. And you, right. Would, you would just hope for nudity in the, uh, in the like early teen years that we were in. You were just like, just like, is there nudity? I don't know. Let's watch it. Let's find out. And then how much would you, do you remember this? Before the movie would come on, the rating would, would uh, show up before. So and it, it would it, say it, it, like a, the code, the letter. Yeah. And it would know, tell you. So you say, knew if you're in say, for a good time or not. It would say L for language. It would say N for nudity. But then of course the one that you like the SC for sexual content. Oh, sexual content. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. And then they would go, they would get morbid. Sometimes there was one for rape. Do you remember an RP for rape? Oh man, I, I, I that was that was a creepy one. You had to make a you had to make a, a conscious decision. Like, am I gonna stick with this movie? All right, let's see what's going on. But yeah, that's right. You would get the little code of what it was in store for you. So sometimes you'd be like nudity and SC. That's right. right. We're watching this. Yeah, and then, they would, and then they'd still put 
And then it'd be like N S C, and then they put like A C adult content. Like, why would you warn about adult content if there's gonna be sexual content <laughs> on this thing? <laughs> yeah, one might argue sexual content is an umbrella concept. Yeah, we got it. We got it all. No need adult content. Right. We got but it. I don't think I don't think language and nudity is is, is, is it's got to be the least of your worries at this point. Yeah, that ship has sailed. We are far off to nudity island right now. We're in international waters. Yeah, it, you, it goes back to a different time when you prayed for nudity on screen and you got your nudity by random occurrences. You, know, you couldn't plan. You couldn't plan to get, there was no porn you could just look up. You had to just, if we get nudity, that's a cherry on top. And then the funny thing is whoever I'm with, we're watching it together, <laughs> you know? We're there was at, no privacy. And, and, and at a young age, that's when we learned how to control the volume. Because like, we, we'd still wanna, we'd have to have it loud enough to hear it, but we also couldn't have it too loud where we couldn't hear footsteps coming into the room. And, and, right, and that's true. In, and busting in on our TV watch, our, yeah, our if, TV watching. That's right. If you were sleeping over at my house or I'm at your house, we had to be on the watch out for our parents coming down and then eventually we got smart and we would have a safe channel on the recall or flashback recall. button on the and remote it, and, 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 and you just right flip back, it and it would go to the, the the midnight sports center show right we would just flip it to something safe we wouldn't get in trouble for and then like it, it begs the question did our parents know what we were doing <laughs> our parents aren't that dumb they wouldn't know we were up to something giggling our heads off at 11 30 at night with a glowing TV screen. Yeah. I don't know how we, I don't know how we pulled it off. Do you remember, here's a thought I just had. Do you remember number one, the first rated R movie you ever saw? And then number two, do you remember the first time you saw nudity in a movie? I remember my nudity one very well. Okay. Let me see if I can think about this. I think the first rated R was not was not a, a anything sexual. God, Lord knows it wasn't sexual. But I, and and maybe I'm wrong, but what wasn't uh, Nightmare on Elm Street a rated R? I think so. I mean, that was my first rated R movie. I think I saw a Nightmare on Elm Street, the original. Um, I, I, I was was Breakfast Club rated R? Oh, good question. I don't think so. Was it PG thirteen? I want to say Breakfast Club might oddly have been PG. Remember in the eighties, they didn't have. PG 13 till a while. So I think those are my first, my first adult movies. The first time I saw Titty had to have been a Steven Seagal movie. <laughs> Which one was Steven Seagal? People okay. forget Steven Seagal was legit for a brief amount of time. Steven Seagal was a legit karate master action figure for a couple of movies. And then, yeah. it, and then it fell apart. Right. Um, oh, you know, I can also think, of, I, 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 I will tell you the first time I did see nudity on TV. The woman in red with Gene Wilder and Kelly LeBrock. What movie is that? Lady, or, or Lady in Red. But it was a guy that was cheating on his wife with this like supermodel. And his whole, the whole movie was the buildup to him having sex. And right before he had sex with her, something just went wrong. And he ended up like jumping out of the, <laughs> out of the building uh, onto like a trampoline or something, or a net, something like that. <laughs> so but you saw, you almost saw comical nudity. It, well, it was comical. It was, it was the whole thing was huh. a comedy. Uh, but, but for sure, there was a moment that you saw Kelly LeBrock's chest. Really? Yes. That was my huh. first, that was my first nudity. I remember, let's see, my first rated R movie, I think was Delta Force. Okay. And we didn't even make it all the way through the movie. It was too violent and somebody turned it off. We couldn't watch it all. But it was a little enlightening because at some point, like bad guys just shoot innocent people on a boat or something. And I was like, oh man, shit goes down in these movies. Nobody, Nobody's safe in these movies. So I want to guess it was Delta Force but seven minutes of Delta Force. Okay. But first nudity, me and my brother rented Revenge of the Nerds. Oh, and yeah. 
Yeah. Talk about diving into the deep end. There was a very extensive nudity scene in that movie. And it was just kind of like, what the hell is this? And of course, it's every boy's dream because the way you see the nudity is the nerds install a secret camera into the girl's sorority house. Right. So it's every boy's dream to install a camera and have a secret mission to actually achieve, achieve scene nudity. So that was, yeah, that was my first time I saw actual nudity on screen. For sure. Revenge, Revenge of the Nerds, the classic. That is, a, that is a movie that is probably not aged too well, but I defy you to not start laughing during that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds, HBO. Yeah, people will never know the lengths you had to go to to find nudity in the right. early, early 90s. There was also a time where cable TV late night would offer you kind of just like scraps of nudity. They would show you a, mo a movie that had nudity, but it would be, it would be cut out. USA so, up all night. You would watch USA up all night and they would show sort of these cheesy B, B rating kind if, of skin flicks. If B, if B rating, but no, I, I do, I do remember one scene though that I watch where it's the group of buddies all trying to get laid. And the one friend starts to get laid and all his friends go to the window to try and look at him. And uh, the last American virgin. Was that it? I do you remember? Do you remember the scene where the dude is, is, is like, he's on top of the girl and yeah. there's a shot of their feet and he kicks over some candles and the candles ignite the curtains and the friends watching, they see this and they go run in to put out the fire. And then it just smash cuts to the guy who was getting laid, pissed at his friends. And, uh, and he's all mad. And the friends are like, well, we put out the flames. And the guy goes, well, that's for sure. <laughs> his classic, classic B, B movie uh, line. I want to say it was 1982 hit, the last American version, uh, Virgin. Look it up. Because um, I think the guy at the very end the girl he falls in love with, uh, and it looks like she's reciprocating. She ends up back with her ex, and he drives away, and it's a pretty sad ending. <laughs> <laughs> I love how they still attempted a storyline. Good on them. Right. right. Good on them. 2000. We came a long way from just early, mid-90s to 2001 alone. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What a, what a moment. What a sports moment, too. <laughs> great, great era of TV and sports. Right. Yeah, I wonder what it now I think about. I wonder what George Bush's uh, pitch speed would have been. I'm gonna say not even seventy, but we'd 70. have to look. We'd have to look that up. He's a, he is a bit of an older man. I think he's in his late fifties. Uh, let me see if I left anything else out. Uh, college basketball, NCAA champion uh, was Maryland. Maryland, Maryland won. Uh, I, I think Steve Francis wasn't he on that uh, on that squad? I don't remember, but that well, that sounds right. Uh, college football, Ohio State is the national champ that year. Well, don't remember much about in that. 2001, time. that they played the championship in 2002. Right, right. I looked up. These are 2002 champions uh, okay. because the season would have been 2001. Yeah, so yeah. Bas uh, basketball and football are, are like that. Oh, that's a little, it's a little tricky with the turnover of the year there. Right. Um. <clears throat> Let's go back to the president uh, pitch stuff. Did you watch that World Series at all? Yeah, I did. I think that was the height of my World Series viewing was this I mean, era and the Boston Red Sox when they finally won the World Series era. Yeah, I would sure. watch baseball. I was, in my first, I was in my first year of law school and the Red Sox said that. I'm, a, I'm, of course, a Red Sox fan. But I, I think what, what strikes Why the Red Sox me, affiliation? Why do you like the Red Sox? I was born from, in Quincy, Mass. So you were? I, I've always, yeah, Quincy, Mass. <laughs> I don't even remember this. Let's yeah, let's go through your your and I's history. We have known each other since we we're about five, maybe five years maybe. old. We yeah. went to the same I, school, and I, think, and I know you were born in Georgia, and yeah, and, and I was born in Massachusetts, and we ended up meeting in El Paso, Texas. So you you, right. you don't know where both our families are from. 
Uh, so we grew up together in the same school all the way through high school. And then we went to different colleges. Right. Uh, but you were, you're a Boston fan because you were born in Massachusetts. How were you born in Massachusetts? A uh, long story, but I was <laughs> there. Um, I was there. Long story. I was there. But, you know, uh, but I, I, you know that, but that's the only New England team I really, uh, I really took out. I, I you know, I've never was a, wasn't really a Patriots fan. I think when I moved to San Antonio, I want to say that when I was growing up, I was a Lakers fan because I loved Magic Johnson. To me, he was the best. And then there was something about Michael Jordan that I loved, but I wasn't really a Bulls fan. I just loved Michael Jordan. But, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't really uh, into the team, the Bulls, you know. And then when Michael Jordan left um, and I moved to San Antonio, then I, I went with the Spurs and I'm a a huge Spurs fan now, but that came later in life. Um, uh, what turned me off about the Lakers is when Shaq went to the Lakers. Oh, I, I just, see. I just, I just didn't like him. So I love like the that acquisition. I didn't like the acquisition. Um, but uh, Niners, I always loved since I was a kid, as you know that. But Red Sox, I just, I just, I just always really liked the Red Sox, even from the beginning. Uh, maybe it's because I was born in Quincy, which is right outside of Boston. Who knows? But I'm, I'm a huge Red Sox fan. Um, so but, two, 2001, you're in, you're doing your undergrad, I assume, right? Yeah. In San Antonio. Mm -hmm. What was the plan for you then in 2001, was, junior or sophomore in college? I was trying what to get out undergrad of undergrad in. I was trying to get out of college as soon as possible. Um, uh, only because I figured in high school, you know, because we went to an all guy school and I wasn't getting laid in high school. I figured get to college and get laid, but then I come to find out <laughs> that I wasn't, I wasn't getting laid in college either. So I figured out, well, you know, maybe get to law school and maybe you'll start getting laid. Um, so I had to get out of law school. As soon just as gonna just imagine this keeps going. I couldn't get laid in law oh, yeah. school. So, you know, it's like, you know, I gotta, I'll, like, I'll invent streaming television. He's like, you, you I'll gotta, probably get laid there. Yeah. You gotta become a lawyer and get laid. Um, and so, um, but anyway, uh, it, it was definitely, uh, uh, I was in, I was in college. I was trying to get through college as soon as possible. And, uh, at the time, big Spurs fan and, you know, we're, we're, I was a poor college student, so I didn't have like, you know, NFL ticket and all this stuff. So, uh, on Sundays I'd watch the Cowboys because that's what you watched on Sundays in, in San Antonio. Um, you know, Red Sox, I just, just a huge Red Sox fan again. Yeah. Uh, what was your undergrad in? Uh, political science, which is basically a blow off. I, you know, I think, I don't know what it was that people talk you into. Well, if, if you're in political science, you should go to law school. That didn't help you at all. I mean, political <laughs> science is definitely a blow off for me. Um, although I took, I did take, I did meet some interesting people. Um, I worked with the the Castro twins, Julian and Joaquin Castro, uh, at a Senate. I was I was one of their I was I think I was their first intern when they both went into private practice. Uh, you know, obviously Julian became the um, you know the 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 secretary of 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 HUD, and uh, uh, Joaquin is a you know a congressman um, at, at this point. Uh, eventually became a congressman, but you know. San Antonio was a good town. I love San Antonio. That's probably, you know, I'm in, I'm in El Paso right now, but San Antonio is probably the biggest place I would go to. Uh, I don't think I could get much bigger than San Antonio. Population wise. You're yeah. saying? I, I couldn't see myself. And it's just, you know, you go to Houston, it's just so big, but I can see why a sports town would want Houston. You got the Rockets, you got, you got the Texans, you got the, the Astros. I mean, that, that'd be pretty fun, but I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. How about you? Yeah, well, I, I see the, yeah, I live in LA now. I've lived in a bunch of cities and I definitely see the, that medium market city is the sweet spot. The, uh, like 10 years ago, it would have been um, Asheville, North Carolina. 20 years ago, it would have been Seattle. Uh, I've lived in middle market cities like Salt Lake City. Uh, so that middle market city, is where you want because everything is livable. Um, cost of living, the cities can have all the amenities <clears throat> you want of a big city, but with none of the trappings, traffic, pollution, so crime, you don't, you don't, things like you don't, that. You don't feel overwhelmed. 
Yeah. And then at some point, all those cities get discovered and then you have to start all over again. You right. know, everybody will move from the major me- metropolitan city to these places and it'll sort of, so yeah, I hear you that middle market city, you don't know how good you got it until you sort of leave it. And there's all the trappings of the big city. I live in, I've lived in LA for like uh, almost seven years now and it's cost of living, it's traffic, it's everybody here in LA it moved here for a reason. So there's right. ambition, there's goal oriented sort of people here too. And then you start discovering people actually grew up here. I'm yeah. always astonished when I meet someone who's from Los Angeles. I'm like, you live in this? You grew up knowing this? It's, it trips me out a lot too. So it takes a while, at least for me anywhere, to, re- to figure out where I'm most comfortable. It took me a long time to even feel normal and comfortable in Los Angeles. But the other cities I've lived in, uh, right. I got the hang of it in about a year. You know, you get your bearings in right. about a in about a year's time. You figure everything out. So it's really really hard when you move somewhere and you got to reset everything in you. So it's tricky. It's tricky. The cities you see is is really really put some miles on you in a sense. It gives you perspective. Right, for sure. To it all, yeah. Would when you, you were in school um, in San Antonio, you you always want to be, you always were somewhat goal oriented growing up. You mentioned we went to an all boys high school, something I have a lot of thoughts on now, but people will ask like, <laughs> what's it like going to an all boys high school? I'm like, it was like a locker room with desks. It was just nonstop wrestling, farting. Um, it was like Lord of the Flies. With stuff would be on fire. And uh, the funny thing is, if you were, I always was a bit socially shy. And then the notion of going to an all boys high school sound appealing. It was like, oh, great. I don't have to deal with any awkward girl situations. But really what was happening is your growth really gets stunted because you are not forced to interact with women. Right. So yeah, I find it to be an odd experience now, but at the time it just glossed over my head. I remember guys who were like, We need some girls, dude. We need to find some girls. I'm like, for what? What are they going to do? Tell us to go sit over there. I don't, what am I? I don't, I don't need this potential rejection to happen. But in uh, hindsight, you'd be like, you should have forced us to socialize with women. It was an odd school. Very odd school, but yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, you always struck me uh, through school being somewhat goal oriented in the sense that you had. You had a path you wanted to follow. Is that true? Really? I mean, no, you know, I wanted- 2001 Omar Carmona. Did you have a path? No, I, you know, you know, you know, I didn't know I wanted to be a lawyer, but I will say I, you know, you ever see the show Better Call Saul? Yeah. I, I wanted to be him, but back in the day. <laughs> in 2001? How did you yeah. even know that show would exist? It, it didn't know, but that, 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 that's, I, you know. You I'm wanted not- to be the Better, Saul, Better Call Saul yeah, character. I, did. I, I didn't. I didn't. You know, all these thoughts about a corner office overlooking New York and Manhattan and working on a that wasn't for me. I wanted to. I wanted to get myself in the mud and you know and, and do all the cool stuff and and I think I'm doing it now. Um, but yeah, I, there was no plan and I I still don't have a plan. But you wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah, for in sure. Two thousand one. You had, sure. that was a plan. I, I wanted, I wanted my office. Like I wanted to have like a double wide, you know, trailer office, like in the ghetto, you know, next <laughs> to a taco stand and me chasing clients down for money. And that, that's what I wanted. You wanted that. I wanted wow. that. I wanted that. I wanted what do you think? Money. What do you think that is? I think that, ter- I don't know. I don't know. But like, I, I, I look at all these guys that have like these, you know, fancy corporate lawyer, you know, and I'm just like, man, you guys are suckers because this can get pretty fun sometime. And, I, hmm. but then again, they probably look at me and like, wow, well, you're a jerk. <laughs> but, I think so. Wow. <laughs> why, but, uh, why law? Did you have any other um, ambitions going into college? 2001. Yeah. Omar Carmona. It was always law. Yeah, every asshole says, oh, it's because I wanted to help people. No, I wanted to help myself, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but it seems if you wanted to help yourself, you would have went the corporate law route. Am I uh, right? This, you know, what I'm doing today, defending criminals or 
defending the wrongfully accused that that to me is helping i i get i get a, uh, i i get a extreme a, an extreme amount of joy and pleasure doing that so i'm, I'm having fun um it, it's it's a it's a great job and I, I i wouldn't trade this for anything else in the world right now so you made the right yeah it seems like you're very you, you um you're very content with the path and it seems like you are living it i get look man i if it's two o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday and I just feel like popping open a beer, looking at my files, you know what I mean? I get, I get to do that. I don't, have to look, I don't, I don't get to, I don't have to look at a boss and say, Hey, uh, you know, you need me to do anything else for the next few hours. I'm like, no, I, I, I get to do whatever I want, which is, which is great. Um, what's your favorite um, movie involving a law or a lawyer? Great question. Okay. This is going to sound crazy, but every time I watch Matthew McConaughey's closing argument, this is going to be very, uh, uh, I don't want to sound like a cop out, but Matthew McConaughey's argument in A Time to Kill still makes me cry. Oh, really? I don't know that. uh, Yeah, I don't know that one off the top of my head. Although Uh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know that movie. That's a great movie. You got to watch the closing argument again. It's, it's unbelievable. Let's, uh, let's close on that. Next time we do this, we got to do, uh, we got to do some lines from that movie. Let's do it. <laughs> 2001, George Bush threw out the first, p- first pitch. We watched sports. We were 21 years old at the time. Crucial time for the country. And I think that was a big pivot for the country. A starting, a starting of the healing, although we were, we were fresh off of 9-11 at the time. So it's, it's interesting that the tie-ins to now that we're pivoting again with a change in, change in presidency. Uh, people are divided, but I think we, we're still lacking that moment right now where we turn, sure. where it turns. So, And, and there's, there's many reasons behind that, but hopefully once we get this vaccine, I don't give a shit who takes credit for it at this point in time. Just please just get us a vaccine. Let's move on, man. Let's get it out there. It's kind of like where the offensive line is shattered by injury. And the coach says, I need anybody who can block, get yeah. out there and block. Yeah. We need you. If, if somebody if our, runs if, out there, if our president wants to take credit for getting the vaccine, please just give him the credit and, and let's just get the vaccine out. That's all I care about. Let's, let's do it together. Everybody let's, let's all get out there and block. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks Omar. Peace. See you on Sunday. Yeah, for sure. See you there. That is the show. Everybody that is running it back with me and Omar Carmona, 2001 first pitch. Whoa. Did we get into some subjects? I forget how much me and Omar know about each other. We've been friends for so long. So that was a, it was cathartic, I think you would say. Great talk. Hey, if you're new to my channel, I want to thank you for listening to this episode, but I also want to encourage you to listen to me and Omar on Sunday nights, where we talk NFL and beyond categories, awards for the week. We do that every Sunday, um, talking sports and basically what's going on in our lives on a Sunday. That's the night to have a talk, if I were to say, is on Sundays. You got a whole week ahead of you check that channel out give it a like give it a subscribe check it all out and hey don't forget me performing stand-up comedy on the 28th on the flappers comedy club zoom show just hit me up for all the details it's gonna be great that's what i do thank you everyone for listening thank you everyone for giving it the old-fashioned youtube like thumbs up i see it don't think i don't see it everybody stay safe be well i'll see you on the screens bye-bye